over the last several weeks, we've taken a deep dive and started talking about how the, the world, and, and of course that's the enemy working through the world, but the world is trying to pull us away from biblical absolute truth. And to, to, to make us believe that truth can be a little more relative. That truth can be a little more squishy. It can be a little more dependent on your feelings. Or truth can be a little more, uh, you know, depending on your culture or how you were raised and all that. And that's what the world is trying to shove down our throats. And we see that constantly. In the last few weeks, we've talked about that. Well... Also, what I didn't really touch on, we talked about um, absolute truth, but we didn't talk about subjective versus objective truth. And that's just another way to say this. And subjective truth is truth subject to, again, your feelings or your upbringing or whatever's convenient for you. But objective truth is absolute. It's measurable. It's unchangeable. And that's what we believe. We believe absolute objective truth. And the world is trying to pull us away from that. So my title today, uh, again, going through this tough topic series, it's the value of life, all life. All life is extremely valuable. And today what we're going to do, and, and what I've been trying to do in this whole series, is give us biblical, scientific, and common sense tools so that we can, number one, understand for ourselves, but also to have good conversations with people. But today is specifically just going to be the biblical view of the value of life. And then next week we're going to come in and talk about the scientific uh, and the common sense view and some tools that we have to talk about the value of life. Um, but I want to take a second. I understand this is a really big topic. And a lot of these things that we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks, they're really big, heavy topics. And, and actually for you, they might be more than just a topic. It might be trauma in your life. And I, I want you to know as we're going to use words like abortion, rape, incest, murder, I want you to know that I understand the gravity of these words. And I understand some of the emotions that, that these words and these feelings may invoke in you. And I want to be so sensitive to that. And I want you to know that there is grace, mercy, love, forgiveness in all of these things. And, and I need you to know that Island Community Church is a church that dispenses grace and love and mercy and forgiveness. And I need you to know that. Before we even start covering any of these things, I need you to know I understand the things that I'm saying are super heavy. And the things that we're going to be covering over these next few weeks may, um, may offend you. It may cause you to be uncomfortable. It may challenge your truth or what you believe. But I need you to know I want to do this with the most amount of love and understanding and grace as I can possibly bring up. Is that, is that clear? You guys understand that? Like, I just, I just want to be open to what God has me saying from his word, what he wants me to teach from his word. Now, it's obvious that there's nowhere in scripture, and as we start to tackle this, uh, this topic of the sanctity or the value of life or ultimately abortion. I understand there is no verse in scripture that says, thou shalt not have an abortion. Okay, that's not there, so I'm not claiming that that's there. However, there is a ton of biblical evidence that we're going to look at today that points us to the value of life, all life, uh, just Every single, every, from the minuscule, tiniest, microscopic life that's inside of the mother's womb, all the way through. But there's nothing in the Bible that says, like I said, thou shalt not have an abortion. But very interesting, I had lunch with Pastor Pete. Many of you guys know Pastor Pete. He's in the middle of uh, getting his doctorate through Liberty University. Little did I know he 
uh, wrote a dissertation on abortion in the early church. Like, I didn't even know that was a thing. I gotta be honest with you. I didn't even know, like, it was even a topic back then. And so he brought me his paper that he wrote, and he was like, hey, listen, totally up to you, but here's some stuff in here that you may want to use, or at least to know. So I'm gonna read to you of just a very small part of his paper, and then I want to read to you a quote from 177 AD. So this is me right here. He says, Athenagoras of Athens was a second century Christian apologist. Now, an apologist, or, or giving an apology, is not like a, I'm sorry for. An apologist is somebody that argues for the faith, that gives good biblical evidence for the faith. That's what an apologist is. So, it says, Athenagoras of Athens was a second century Christian apologist who wrote an apology to the emperor Marcus Aurelius in 177 AD. One of the more interesting passages in, and then he, he says the name of the, uh, the writing, it's called An Embassy for the Christians. He says one of the more interesting passages in the An Embassy for the Christians pertains to a pernicious rumor among the pagan Romans that the Christians killed and ate infants as part of their secret ceremonies. So here's what's happening. Romans who hated Christians were making up these lies about Christians and saying they're having these weird secret ceremonies and they're sacrificing children and they're eating them. This was really happening in 177 AD. So this guy, Athenagoras, was writing to the emperor saying, this isn't what happens. Let me tell you how we feel about this, okay? So it goes on, it says, Athenagoras responded that Christians not only do not kill infants and eat them, but are not allowed to expose newborn infants or even induce abortions of the unborn, never mind kill and eat them. So this guy, this Christian apologist in 177 AD, is writing this paper to say, hey, not only do we not kill them and eat them, because that's absolutely ridiculous, like, we as Christians, we're not even allowed to induce abortions and have them, because we see that as murder. Now, I want to read exactly what Athenagoras wrote. He says this, And when we say that those women who use drugs to bring on abortion commit murder, so he's declaring it right there, that women that use drugs to actually have a miscarriage or to commit abortion. When he's saying, we say that they are committing murder and will have to give an account to God for the abortion, on what principle should we commit murder? So he's saying, listen, if we believe that it is wrong, that it is murder for a woman to take drugs to induce an abortion, we believe that this is murder. He goes on. For it does not belong to the same person to regard the very fetus in the womb as a created being, and therefore an object of God's care, and when it has passed into life, to kill it, and not to expose an infant, because those who expose them are chargeable with child murder, and on the other hand, when it has been reared, to destroy it. I bet you didn't know that was written in 177 AD. This is less than 150 years after Christ's crucifixion. And here we have the teachings of Jesus to the disciples and apostles, and that very teaching being passed down to the church. And this was even an issue back then. So when we look at Scripture, and again, it doesn't say, Thou shalt not have an abortion. But we can look at scripture and we can look at things like this that the very earliest of teachings that it is murder. Now, as we're having these conversations, as we're developing our worldview, or maybe even reshaping our worldview, or as we're disagreeing with our opponents uh, in when we're having these discussions, we have to remain consistent. Consistency is key because anytime that you're having a, a discussion or an argument with someone and there's an inconsistency, that's usually where we've lost. So we've got to know what scripture says and know what has been taught from the very, very beginning. And see, 
This is where the world creeps in. This is where the world tells us, well, yes, it's wrong, except for, and then there's, you know, some of these other very rare cases, and we're going to talk about those next week. But no, 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 no. What's wrong is wrong. We don't get to change values. We don't get to change what's right and wrong just because of convenience or what the world is saying. We must stay consistent. Now, here's my, my target statement for today. This is, if you go home, just give me one thing. This is it. All life has immeasurable value from the womb to the tomb. All life. Every single life. And this message is good for all of us because you know what? Maybe today you've come and you don't feel incredible value. This isn't just about the unborn. This is about every single life God has created you. And you have immeasurable value to God. And this is one of the main points of argument from the pro-abortion side. And they say, well, it's not a life until it's born. Well, we are going to debunk that today, period, point blank, no more discussion by looking in God's Word. So, what I want us to look at today is five biblical points on the value of life, all life. So we're going to bounce around to a bunch of scripture today. You may not have time to flip through in your Bible, so maybe you just want to write down the references. Maybe you want to take a picture on the screen, but today we're going to see five biblical points on the value of life, all life. And I'm sure there's more, and the five is as much as I dug in and found, and I just wanted to concentrate on these things, and honestly, I think these are enough. So five biblical points on the value of life, all life. Number one, pretty simple, we are God's creation. We were created by God. I think that's a pretty good reason to believe that we have absolute value. Psalm 100 verse 3 says, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, not anything else. It is he who made us and we are his. And then in case you didn't get what he's trying to say there, David, what are you trying to say? We are his. We are his people. He just backs up and repeats it again. And then he says something very strange. The sheep of his pasture. Now, to us, that may not mean a whole lot. The sheep of his pasture. Because, I don't know about you, I don't know a whole lot about sheep. Okay? I, I think sheep are kind of cool, but I think sheep are kind of dumb. Okay? But for David, a shepherd, to write this and to state this, this was extremely meaningful. Because Jesus later on would come along and say, I'm the good shepherd. And I lay my life down for my sheep. And David, David was a good shepherd to his sheep. And David went off and he fought bears and he fought lions to save one sheep. So for David to say this, like, like we are God's sheep, like that would bring incredible value to the reader back then. To know that the, the, the good shepherd, a shepherd would lay his life down for the sheep. So how do we, how do we know that we have value? Because we're God's creation. Because he is our shepherd. Because he made us. We are his, as this verse says. We belong to him. <laughs> A lot of times people try to say, well, you know, we're just, you know, a biological evolutionary accident, right? We're just a bunch of accidents. Or... We're here because of the process of natural selection. Or um, we evolved from fish or monkeys or pond scum, right? And that's what a lot of people try to say. Or, you know, uh, here's my favorite. In the beginning, not the Bible verse, but like before there was anything, there was a bunch of nothing in space. And all this nothing got together and poof, here we are. Crazy? Yeah. And by the way, when you have to break laws of science, and laws in science are absolute, irrefutable laws, like you can't change them. When you have to break the law of biogenesis, 
and the laws of thermodynamics to make your theory work, that's bad science. Or, let me just throw something crazy out there. You could believe that there is a loving creator that created every single one of us with absolute value. Which one of those sounds better? I would think option number two, right? We evolved from monkeys, and I mean, I know some people that, you know, <laughs> or we have this loving creator that values us enough to send his son Jesus to die for us. I'll take option number two every single day. So number one, we're God's creation. Number two, we are made in the image of God. Now, this is a really big deal. Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, Let us... Now, what does that mean, us? We talked about it a little bit last week. Remember, God is three parts. One God, three parts. God the... God the... And God the... Okay, so three parts. So God is saying, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. The Latin word for this, or words for this, is imago day in the image of God and the likeness of God and this differentiates us from the rest of creation now I started to make some notes to explain what the image of God means and what I, I was just like you know what I'm gonna do a terrible job of this so I want you to check out this video it's about three minutes and explains what it means to be made in God's image go ahead guys what does it mean that humanity is made in the image of God we're gonna answer that question on the last day of creation, God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Thus, he finished his work with a personal touch. God formed Adam from the dust and gave him life by sharing his own breath. Because of this, humanity is unique among all of God's creations, having both a material body and a material soul, spirit. Having the image or likeness of God means simply that we were made to resemble God. Adam did not resemble God in the sense of God's having flesh and blood. Scripture says that God is spirit and therefore exists without a body. However, Adam's body did mirror the life of God insofar as it was created in perfect health and was not subject to death. In Imago Dei, Latin for the image of God, refers to the immaterial part of humanity. It sets human beings apart from the animal world, fits them for dominion God intended for them to have over the earth, and enables them to commune with their maker. It is a likeness, mentally, morally, and socially. Let's break it down a little further. Mentally, humanity was created to reason and make choices. This is a reflection of God's intellect and freedom. Anytime someone invents a machine, writes a book, paints a landscape, enjoys a symphony, calculates a sum, or names a pet, he or she is proclaiming the fact that we are made in God's image. Morally, humanity was created in righteousness and perfect innocence, a reflection of God's holiness. Our conscience, or moral compass, is a vestige of that original state. Whenever someone writes a law, recoils from evil, praises good behavior, or feels guilty, they are confirming the fact that we are made in God's own image. Socially, humanity was created for fellowship. This reflects God's triune nature and his love. In the Garden of Eden, humanity's primary relationship was with God. In fact, God made the first woman because it is not good for man to be alone. Every time someone marries, makes a friend, hugs a child, or attends church, they are demonstrating the fact that we are made in the likeness of God. Part of being made in God's image is that we have the capacity to make free choices. Although they were given a righteous nature, Adam and Eve made an evil choice to rebel against their creator. In doing so, they marred the image of God within themselves and passed that damaged likeness on to all their descendants. Today, we still bear the image of God, but we also bear the scars of sin. Mentally, morally, socially, and physically, we show the effects of sin. The good news is that when God redeems an individual, he begins to restore the original image of God, creating a new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. 
That redemption is only available by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior from the sin that separates us from God. Through Christ, we are made new creations in the likeness of God. That answers the question, what does it mean that humanity is made in the image of God? Well, that was way better than I could uh, explain that. But that sets us apart, like I said, from all of the rest of the creation, that there is this imprint of God on us. So, number one, we're God's creation. That makes us extremely valuable. Number two, we're made in the image of God. Number three, we are made with great intricacy by God. Great intricacy, very, very detailed that we are made. Genesis 2, 7 says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now this is pretty interesting. Until this moment, how had everything else been created. How did God create everything else before this? He spoke it. Notice that man was the very first thing that God touched. And it says he scooped up some dust, which might explain some of the problem with men, but <laughs> throw that out there. Scooped up some dust and formed it, breathed breath into it, and made it alive. That's pretty special. That God didn't just speak mankind into existence, but that he literally touched us to form us. Now, ladies, I don't want to leave you out because that was just man. If you drop down to verse 22 of Genesis 2, it says, Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And if you actually look at the word made, it says made a woman, there's a better translated word for it, it's fashioned. And you almost get the sense, and I don't know, maybe I'm pulling this a little bit out of context, but you almost get this sense that he took a little bit more time in fashioning a woman. Ladies, can I get an amen? <laughs> that <up> there. <laughs> Psalm 139, which I'm sure you guys were probably thinking when we were going to talk about the scriptural basis of the value of life, that we, of course, we're going to go to Psalm 139. Yes. So Psalm 139, starting in verse 13, this is like the iconic passage for the value of, of the unborn. It says, for you, David writing here, speaking of God, for you created my inmost being, like every single little part of me, God, you created it. And then he says this, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I've read that a million times. Think about the details of that. That David is saying, God, like, like when I was just like this clump of cells, and we're going to talk about that next week. When, when I was just this kind of little blob of goo, you were working and you were knitting me together perfectly according to how you see a human should be built in your likeness, very intricately made. That's how you were creating me in my mother's womb. So David is giving credit to God for actually forming him in his mother's womb. He goes on, verse 14, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. That means, God, you knew every little detail about me when I was inside of my mother. When I was woven together, there's that, that picture of, of weaving or knitting together. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth. God made us very intricately, very specifically. I mean, you can just look at human biology and see that we have miles of blood vessels running through us, taking oxygen throughout all of our bodies. Like, the, the human body is nothing short of a miracle. And we want to call that an accident? No. God very 
in a very detailed way, created us exactly like he wanted us. We're not fakes, we're not copies, we're not nothing. I was thinking about um, in late September, we went to New York City, and we may have ventured over to Chinatown, and we may have uh, walked down Canal Street on Chinatown. Anybody know where I'm going with this? Anybody walked Canal Street in Chinatown before? What do you go to buy on Canal Street in Chinatown? First, handbag. They'll actually come up behind you. Handbag, 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 handbag. And they just keep saying it like that. It's kind of weird, okay? There's a lot of handbags out there for sale, and you can get a really nice Louis Vuitton for like 40 bucks. I'm not saying I did, I'm just saying I know that you can do that. Um, but it's not really a Louis Vuitton, is it, right? It's more like a Louis Vuitton, <laughs> right? And like, it looks pretty good. The stitching's okay. The buttons are mostly where they're supposed to be. But it's a fake. It's not real. You see, that's not how God created us. There's, there's an old saying, I, I hate the grammar, but I love the theology. God don't make no junk. And God made us perfect, perfectly and intricately. So, number one, we are God's creation. Number two, we are made in the image of God. Number three, we are made with great intricacy by God. Number four, we have been given eternity by God. This is a really, really big one. That God gave us eternity. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. And this is the passage of time we want a time to die in the kind of psalm. Okay, that's where it all comes from, Ecclesiastes 3. It says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. What in the world does that mean? This is a big deal. Okay, so remember we already said God is three parts, one God, three parts, God the, God the, God the, okay, just making sure you guys are paying attention. Like God is three parts, did you know that we are three parts too? We are body, this is what you can see, what you can touch, what you can feel. We are spirit, which is our personality. Your spirit is what makes you you. It's, it's the personality part of you. So we're body, we're spirit, but we're also soul. We have something different from the rest of all of creation, from the rest of the animal kingdom, from the monkeys that supposedly we evolved from, from every other creation, we have a soul. And that soul is going to spend eternity somewhere. And this shows our incredible value that God didn't just make us one of the other creations. He made us the most important creation. Here's a, an online source. I wrote this down. It says, Ecclesiastes 3.11 affirms the idea that humans operate in a different way than other forms of life. We have a sense of eternity in our lives. We possess an innate knowledge that there is something more to life than what we can see and experience in the here and now. And I know you can talk to people that, that call themselves atheists and they say, no, when you die and that's it, and they probably believe that. But Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, there is still something inside of them in their hearts that they know there is more than just this life. And that's how God created us different from everything else. And this gives us value and even dominion, as the video said, dominion over every other thing that has been created. Genesis 1.26, back to that verse, it says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that, okay, so now it's differentiating why God created us, humankind, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock, and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And when we see human life as anything different than this perspective, anything different than God created us so different than anything else, we cheapen the value of life. And therefore, the next step is to cheapen the value of an unborn child. And we've got to see God made us so intricately detailed with an exact purpose. So number one, 
We're God's creation. Number two, we are made in the image of God. Number three, we are made with great intricacy by God. Number four, we've been given eternity by God. And number five, we are made with great purpose by God. This one, I don't know if I have a favorite, but this one might be my favorite of all of them. That God has designed every single one of us for a purpose. And, and I know I say this all of the time, that God has a special plan and a special purpose for your life. But every single person was created. Now, Jeremiah 29, 11, we all know this verse. Probably most of us could quote this verse. People like me, pastors, we use this verse all the time. So it says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. This is God saying this to Jeremiah. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And that's an awesome verse. But we could say, okay. But see, Jeremiah is a man. He's an adult. And, and while I love this verse, he's speaking to Jeremiah as a man. That really doesn't have anything to do with the unborn. Well, let's look back at Psalm 139, verse 16. We stopped at 15 last time. This is in verse 16. It says, your eyes saw my unformed body. So, okay, so just in case anybody's questioning, our unformed bodies are in our mother's womb. Like, it still like looks like a peanut, okay? We used to call Isla when we saw the ultrasound. We called her peanut because she looked like a peanut, okay? So that's what David is talking about here. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me, which means my entire life until the day that I pass into eternity. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. You know what that means, church? When we take Jeremiah 29, 11, that God has a perfect plan for us, plans to give us hope and a future, and we couple that with God's omniscience, his, his all-knowing power, he knows everything, before it even happens, he knows everything. When we put those two things together, and then we look at Psalm 139, 16, God had a plan for us, not only when we were in our mother's womb, not only when we were being formed, but in God's omniscience, God knew our plan. The plan that he had for us, a very special, certain plan, before we were even conceived. So we can look at life from even before conception, the thought that God knew who we were before we were conceived. But then especially since that moment that we were conceived and said, God has a perfect, special plan for me. And he has a perfect, special plan for every person, every child, born or not. We don't get to argue this point. We can disagree with the point, but that doesn't make us right. But I would hate to think that I would think that I have the right to interrupt what God is forming in the womb, something that he knows, something that he has a very, very special plan for. I would hate to interrupt that life and to murder that unborn child, knowing what I know, knowing that God sees all life as immeasurably valuable. I want to leave us on this last verse here. This is Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. It says this, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, now look back to Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. God has a very, very special plan and purpose for every single life. And we have, human beings, people have no right to take that life. Even if it's just two cells first coming together. And again, we're going to talk about that part. It's incredible stuff next week. You will not want to miss next week. But from that moment that those two cells come together, that is a life. We have no right 
to take that life because God sees that life as so valuable. So five things from Scripture to know that life is absolutely valuable. Number one, we're God's creation. Number two, we're made in the image of God. Number three, we're made with great intricacy by God. Number four, we've been given eternity by God. And number five, we are made with great purpose by God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for life. God, we thank you that there is so much scripture and we just scratched the surface on what you say in your word, that how much you value us. And God, I know that we're really leaning into this topic of, of abortion and the sanctity of life, but God, we know that this is so much bigger than that. That no matter what life it is, no matter if it's an unborn, no matter if it's a three-year-old, no matter if it's a middle schooler, a 30-something-year-old, or a 90-something-year-old, God, you value that life more than anything. And God, thank you that you show in your word that you value that life so much. John 3, 16, for you so loved the world that you sent your only son, Jesus, to die for us. Thank you, God, that your son is the good shepherd, that he laid his life down. For us as sheep. And God, if there's anybody this morning who does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, who has never made the commitment to give you their life, God, right now in this moment, would they say, God, thank you for your sacrifice. God, I need a Savior. I, 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 I have sin in my life. And that sin cannot enter into heaven until eternity with you. So God, help me to build my life on a firm foundation of Jesus Christ. God, help me to throw away all of the stuff that I've been trying to do to earn my salvation. God, help me to fully trust in you. God, I give you my life this morning. If you said that this morning for the first time, heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. I'd love to know. Would you just slip your hand up? I'm not going to call you out. I just want to be able to pray for you. Thank you. Jesus, we just come again before you this morning. So grateful that you love us that much. God, help us to be a church that is a dispenser of grace. God, and as we are working through these tough topics, God, we know the enemy is at work. So many things have happened these last several weeks, but God, guess what? You're bigger, and you will receive victory. So God, help me as I'm planning, as I'm preaching these messages, to preach it exactly how you want me. And God, help us as Island Community Church to be a force for your kingdom in this world. We thank you, God, that you are an amazing God. And we pray all of this in the awesome, most holy name of Jesus. Amen.